welcome to today's webinar, The Great Eight, A Deep Dive into Pepper. I am Ross Fischoff, National Sales Manager for the Healthcare Regulatory and Coding Division of Walters Kluwer. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some quick instructions on how to use the webinar system. For questions, please use the Q&A menu bar located on the GoToWebinar menu on the right side of your screen to submit questions as all lines have been placed on mute. For handouts, you can download a copy of today's presentation, select handouts on the GoToWebinar toolbar and follow the instructions. Handouts will also be sent with the automated follow-up email to the webinar. Today's webinar has been approved for 1.0 hours from the HCCA and is pending approval of one hour from uh, AHIMA for CEUs. An email with a survey and download instructions will be sent within one to two business days of the webinar. With that out of the way, I'm pleased to welcome back Chris Mastrangelo, the President and CEO of Harmony Healthcare International. Chris's leadership and vision have helped Harmony Healthcare become one of the most recognized and trusted consulting companies for compliance and reimbursement in the healthcare industry. Chris brings her post-acute care expertise along with more than 20 plus years experience in this industry as an occupational therapist and licensed nursing home administrator and she holds a master's in business administration. With that, I'll turn the floor over to Chris. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's great to partner with Walters Kluwer. Um, we always have a phenomenal turnout and um, invigorating subject matter. So um, today we're going to take a deeper look into the pepper. This is a spin-off of our grade eight, in which we talked about a few months back the eight most important things to be aware of with the changing um, reimbursement payment reform that's coming pretty soon to all of you in October of 2018. So I will begin with, um, you know, that's my bio. That's uh, I finally got an updated picture. So as you know, I had the long hair, but I cut it. So you always have to have an updated photo from a social media perspective, and that's in Chicago. So for the, for the Chicago viewers, I finally saw the bean. The bean is super cool. It's a great place for a selfie. So um, onward and upward, here we go. We're going to talk about the disclosure is that, you know, the planners are a team that, that you all know quite well. We have Alisa Bowlby, Diane Buckley, Carrie Hart, and myself that have contributed to all, you know, PowerPoints and creations and content. And I'm your presenter today. So we are going to talk about the pepper. And it was interesting because, you know, the pepper has many, many uses. And we are, you know, as we do our compliance training today, we, in this the three-day program that we're in, we had a, an invigorating conversation yesterday about the PEPR, and I realized that only five out of ten executive directors download their PEPR. And the PEPR is filled with very important information for you to plan, audit, and toggle in relation to the data. So one of the things that we want to review is the old pepper versus the new pepper and what elements. So today in the 45 minutes or so that I'll be speaking, we will talk about the elements of the pepper. We're going to talk about percentile ranking and you know really understand what a percentage is versus a percentile. We're going to talk about target areas and we're going to talk about summarizing your data and communicating it to your to your key players, and also we're going to look at facility specific indicators, risk in, risk factors that a Medicare reviewer, an auditor, or an outside entity might think that could be perceived or lead to areas that you want to have further focus on. And how would you use your pepper to create a facility specific action plan? And while this may seem daunting, it's very, very simple. So, and that's the goal. The goal is to take very complicated information and distill it for you. Now, um, what I'm telling everyone across the country is that it's a very stressful time. We're up until 2 a.m. There is a new regulation every day. There's PVJ, there's quality measures, there's all of these things occurring. 
and it's fast and furious. And maybe that's partly due to it's, that it's an election year. So have no fear. Sit back, breathe, and understand that those that are successful, it's not the smartest, it's not the strongest. It's those that are adaptable to change. So you sit in your seat as the leaders, the leaders in the post-acute industry, and you say, what is happening? And have that widen your gaze and see the opportunity in front of you and how to run your business because there's mounds of opportunity. So that's my Darwin quote for the day. The grade eight, grade eight is going to always be a presence because, you know, we can understand eight elements. The pepper is number six. So we're talking about number six today, the pepper, but understand as we sit right now, those are the areas, the impact act, value-based purchasing, your five-star proposed rule, obviously compliance, bundled, and antibiotic stewardship are your top eight areas of focus right now. Okay, so PEPRA, what does it stand for? Program for Evaluating Proper Payment Electronic Reports. So interestingly enough, I was having a conversation yesterday, and if anyone remembers, prior to the PEPRA, there was this another report that came out, but we didn't know what to do with it. I actually stumbled upon it last night at midnight, and it was called the Comparative Analysis and it was sent out in September of 2012. The reason I bring this up is because that report, when it was sent out, the government said, hey, you know what, we're going to show you how you compare and contrast to all the other 16,000 skilled nursing facilities across the country, and we want to see how you react. The concept is they want to influence behaviors based on knowledge. For example, when I get my electric bill, it tells me how I compare to my neighbors. So I have this really, really big bar of electrical usage, and it's probably like five times my neighbors, so they're trying to influence me to use elec less electricity. But they're telling me, well, I have four daughters, so I have a lot of electricity usage. But that's the concept. Here's some information. How do you compare and contrast? and how can we influence your behaviors, okay? So those are little sidebar nuggets for you to have to think about. Now, the pepper has or had six components, therapy rugs with high ADLs, non-therapy rugs with high ADLs, the COT, change of therapy assessments, ultra rug, ultra high rugs, therapy rugs, and your 90-day episodes of care. Today, there are five. They removed the second to last bullet called therapy rugs. We will talk about the specifics of each target area, but you will also hear me elaborate on the importance of that fifth bullet and why you should continue to track that. Okay? So I'm going to actually stay on the slide. Let's talk about the bullets globally. ADLs. The first two bullets are activities of daily living. So we know that there are 66 rug levels, and in those 66 rug levels, there are end splits. An end split, essentially, is a delineation between one level to the next strictly on, in this case, ADLs, which includes bed mobility, eating, toileting, transfers, B-E-T-T, -T, bed. Bed mobility, eating, toileting, and transfers. When the ADL is coded on B-E-T-T, -T, it can influence your reimbursement upwards of $100 a day. So the reason this is a target area is because the government wants to track how you're coding, and how much support you provide in activities of daily living. There are two bullets, therapy, that means they have an R, it's a rehab rug category, and non-therapy, which would be a nursing category with ADL. So they're both looking at activities of daily living. Now, this is a very important discussion because ADLs will be with you for the next decade at minimum. ADLs are an end split. ADLs are Section G, ADLs are Section GG, which is Sweet 16, October 1st, 
ADLs are what constitute a patient's functionality. Although there are other areas like grooming and bathing and, and walking and transferring, these four areas denote reimbursement by virtue of the fact that they are the late loss ADLs. Late loss ADLs means that they're the last to go. So when one declines, then this is really indicative of someone's end of their life. So the target areas are looking, how are you coding in activities of daily living? They're interested in that. We can have a sidebar conversation on ADLs because there, it can be a huge discrepancy on accuracy if the players in your facilities do not understand how to code ADLs. So for example, if I am a patient that requires lots of assistance, like a max assist to transfer every day, and it's one person, I will be coded as an extensive assist. 90 days later, if I require Minisyst, I simply take the patient's back of his or her pants and I lift them up three times in seven days with Minisyst, 25% of my effort, and then they ambulate the rest of the day, they're also coded as an extensive assist. I find that this information is extremely valuable to you because when you are looking at your RUGS ADL data, the first thing you need to do is validate that coding is accurate and there's an understanding. Never ever perceive that ADL coding is perfect. It never will be and it never can be. The patient changes too frequently, there are too many players, there are too many changing staff members, so understand it's, it's a high priority. Okay? So target areas, number one and number two, activities of daily living. The third target area is change of therapy assessments. COTs, also known as. Now, October 1st, 2011 is when this assessment was originated, and it is an assessment that a provider completes when the services rendered differ than the payment level. So I'm going to say that the same way. I'm going to say it a different way, but I'm going to say the same thing. Every seven days, after there is an attained rug level, there is a look back period, and the provider will say, okay, we're getting paid at an RU, but the minutes have dipped below the RU. Okay, I have to now complete a COT, and when I complete that COT, it's going to change the payment. So the essence of this is that you are not in a prospective payment system. When October 1st, 2011 rolled around, you were in a real-time payment system, and it was with the advent of a COT. The next bullet is the ultra-high rug. The ultra-high rug is 720 minutes in a seven-day period. And we can have a phenomenal conversation about ultra-high rugs and therapy rugs because when one has treated as myself, as an occupational therapist during the cost-based, when we treated seven days a week and we looked at were the services reasonable and necessary, did it require the daily skills, knowledge, and judgment of a therapist, we did not have a minute um, calibration to our services. So in 1998, with the advent of PPS and this 720 and 500, these minutes, it was very confusing to someone like me because it almost minimized my, my perceived um, skills and knowledge because I would treat at what I thought was appropriate. So all everyone perceived 720 minutes is a lot of minutes. Now, this is a very important discussion here because when, as an OT, when I walk into a building at 6.30 a.m. and the CNAs are high-fiving me, and I proceed on to do an activities of daily living and dress and bathe and groom and observe a patient's, a patient's status, strength, function, mobility, cognition, decision planning, attention to task, all of these things, it probably will take me anywhere between 45 and 90 minutes. And if I'm not just going to see that patient in the morning because 
many, many things occur throughout the day, and I probably will see the patient at maybe at lunch or in the afternoon to see how they, they behave and function and what types of interventions are appropriate. In order to attain a 720-minute level, in a scenario of five days a week of therapy, and let's just say we're not giving Saturday and Sunday, and let's just also say that we're not going to give speech because we can't find them. So we're going to say that in order to attain a 720 minute, that would mean that someone would need to render 72 minutes of OT and 72 minutes of PT in a given day. So if there are therapists on the call that have treated in the olden days like myself, that to us is not perceived as a lot of minutes. Now, having said that, I am not saying that every patient should be at an ultra high level. I am saying that in the rendering of services that it's not something that was difficult to, to render if the patient required the clinical care in a five-day period. So, and in a cost-based environment when we treated, we never discriminated based on payer source. So if a patient had Medicaid, we would treat them the same as the managed care and the Medicare. So we talk about making sure that the team renders services that are clinically appropriate and that the patient if they can tolerate and it's beneficial, we would render said services, okay? That's, we need to have that discussion. Therapy rugs, the one that's being omitted, is, oh, let me back up, ultra-high rugs, the calculation is the number of RU days divided by rehab days. This is tricky now. So if I have 10 patients on pod A, only five are in rehab, right? The rest are in a nursing category, but all five are in an RU, that would be 100%. So that is a little tricky because sometimes the calculation would be the number of ultra, five out of 10 patients would be 50%. So that, that's something that you need to look at. Therapy rugs is the number of rehab days versus total days. The industry average is 90%. Nine out of 10 patients are in a rehab rug category. Why? Because over 87 mandates that you have the patients, that get their patients to the highest practical state of well-being, and decline is not acceptable. So therapeutic intervention on patients is common in conjunction with nursing resources. It's what is rendered. And then we have the 90-day episodes of care. It's a little complicated. But the essence of this, a lot of you are not seeing any of these show up because for the patients that have been in your building and utilizing 90 plus days of their Medicare benefit, okay? So understanding the definitions is number one. Number two is saying, okay, let you, me, you download your most recent pepper. It's about 14 pages, and now you need to analyze it. So you know me, those of you know me, I'm with my ADHD. I'm not going to look at 14 pages. I need one page. So I get the dream team together, and I say, make it happen. And what do we come up with? One page. So the government says, OK, I'm going to look at those six, well, really now five metrics. And I'm going to give you a percentage of that metric, and I'm going to compare and contrast you to all the other SNFs across the country. And if you are in the 80th percentile or above, or the 20th percentile and below, then we think that that probably would require more investigation. So the visual that I show you, but let's stop for a second. Understand what a percentile is. It's comparing and contrasting. So if a simple example is Savannah Lee, my eldest. Let's just say Savannah Lee gets. 72% on her SATs. Ooh, that's horrible, right? It's a C minus, right? Well, no. She was in the 90th percentile. So she got a better grade than 9 out of 10 or 90 out of 100 students across the country. So when reading the report, it's very easy to get confused with the percentages and the percentiles because as it's read. So on this grid, what, to give you the, the, the visual, the blue square is the SNF. The red line is the percentile, the, not, the 80th percentile, but I put it in percentages 
and the green is the 20th, okay, and I put that in percentages as well. So if you're looking at it, you're saying, okay, let's think about this building, and any square above or below would require an audit or further investigation. So let's look at this. So in this particular case, we see therapy rug days. Interestingly enough, this particular facility is at 72%. This is the best example because this particular facility, and this, by the way, is old, and I won't tell you what state this facility is in, but this is the best example you'll ever hear. So I'm reviewing this pepper with the CEO, and I say, interesting, and he has multiple buildings, but all of his other buildings fall in that typical average of 90. So says, what do you think, Chris? I said, I don't know. Because, you know, typically when you're looking at the pepper and you're near the green, you know, it's under utilization. And if it's above the red, I really want to focus on compliance, right? And when I say under utilization, what I mean is that there's probably some errors in coding or misunderstanding how to um, document or there's something, something, something is happening. So we do an integrity audit. Well, I don't want to give the scenarios because this is like a public call, but in this particular situation, the audit resulted in a change, and it was essentially a million-dollar savings. Um, an aversion of something bigger because of this categorization. In other words, some of the causes of the 70% were because of an outside provider, and this particular facility changed it up, and they didn't get caught in the crossfire. So I find it interesting that that utilization or that metric is going to be removed because I find it invaluable, and I recommend that you continue to code it and track it because it, it, it's, it's just extremely informative. Now, I also mentioned to you that in a, at a glance, with this dashboard, as I'm looking at that blue square, if I see that it's in between the red and the green, I'm like, okay, I'm going to call that the sweet spot, just dubbing it that name. But that typically I said that if they're down the green, I'm like, okay, that means that there's some miscoding going on. I can only suspect. I only, I only, you know, something's happening. But there is one that I have to point out, the one we're going to go all the way to the right now to change your therapy assessments because the COT which came into effect October 1st, 2011, if that's low or below the green, you definitely have to do a focused audit on that because it means that the building may not be completing them or aware. So happened le legitimately in the last six months. I met someone. They gave me their pepper. I did it. I said, listen, they were way below the line. Well, the therapy staff was unaware that they needed to complete COTs. And by the way, I'm not judging because with all the information coming, it's just it's easy to overlook, okay? So all the ones down below the green, usually that would mean underpayment, undercoding, underutilization. Above the red, hmm, it looks a little excessive. What's going on here? Now, there is no good or bad pepper. It doesn't mean if they're all above the red that something's wrong. What it means is that if therapy rug days is at 100%, you want to take a look at the types of patients and assess if they're only getting therapy and are there any nursing categories, is there any nursing services, are they being skilled for nursing. If the ultra rug high is above the red, you're going to be looking at, hmm, does the documentation show that the daily skills, knowledge, and judgment of a therapist were required? Was there a reasonable expectation of improvement in a reasonable period of time? Did the, the, the patient require the establishment of a maintenance program? You know, talking about the GMO settlement, which should be hot on your mind. And so what does the documentation say? 
What does the document, what, is the, what are the systems in the facility? Is there um, a systematic approach or is it patient-centered? Are the therapist documenting with the patient-centered and individual or is it everything look the same? Definitely take a look at the minutes. Um, we know that's been a focus from an OIG perspective. Is there fluctuation in minutes, other minutes? You know, what's happening with those minutes? Those are the areas you want to look at there. And then, when, with regards to therapy ADLs and non-therapy ADLs, well, well, you're going to be looking at the CNA flow sheets. You're going to be looking at the nursing documentation. You're going to be looking at whether the ADLs have supporting documentation in the medical record. Again, you and I both know that OBRA 87 spurred the creation of and the usage of the MDS in 88 and 89. And at that time, the MDS was a source document. However, now that the MDS has morphed into a reimbursement tool, guess what? You'd have to have the supporting document for that coding on the thousand points of information on the MDS. So activities of daily living, you're looking at how are we coding? Is it accurate? Does it reflect the patient's performance? And you're going to be scrutinizing any square above or below. So now, if and when someone comes into review, you have a full-blown understanding of why your metrics are there. OK? Very good. Now, the next slide is the exact same information, but I just put it in a different format. I'm also showing you that you are compared to the state nationally and your MAC. So let's do this. And this is where it helps to show the confusion. You can see the therapy high ADLs is at 51.6. It's red because it's above the 80th percentile. So what happens, what I'm saying to you is that the therapy high ADLs was 51.6%. And nationally, this particular building's in the 85th percentile. In their jurisdiction, they're in the 80th second or 83rd percentile in the state. So this would be a high likelihood of a trigger of an audit. Non-therapy ADLs, well, they were 26.7. That was a percentage. Percentile ranking was 58, 46, and 40, respectively. And then you can see that those COTs were 6.9%, which put them in the 19 right under that line of, hmm, they're not completing as many nationally, but in their state and in their MAC, they're in the sweet spot. So again, comparative analysis, where, how do you compare to everyone around you? And then ultra-high rug days at 58.5%, they're in the 64th, 72nd, and 69th percentile. And the therapy rug days, 72.8%. Again, what's going on here? Is there a vent unit? What's going on? Why is it low? Why isn't it the national average? So. And then you can see that that's a trigger for review, which did occur. And then the 90-day episode of care, which is right there. But what I did was, because I know you love numbers, I said I have to toggle it for them because in this particular analysis, or excuse me, depiction, the left is the actual sniff. But what I gave you on the right, and by the way, these numbers change with every pepper, right? Fascinating, as you can see, that the 20th percentile for therapy rug days, again, that is the calculation of how many patients are in a rehab category. The 20th goes from 86.3 up to the 80th percentile of 97.2. So you can see the range of the sweet spot, but I think of more, more interest to you would be the ultra, because this particular building is at 58.5, but it, the range is 31.4 to 75.9. Fascinating, isn't it? Because you see, if you were around in 1998, I'm sure, and I've got to get the exact number, but the first year that percentage was probably 15 to 20 percent because everyone was freaking out. They perceived it as a lot of minutes. They were faxing in approvals to change their ARDs. I mean, it was just a crazy time, right? But why now is it increased? Well, the government may perceive that as a negative. Why are you giving more therapy? Why? We, we don't think it's bad. Or is it that people are more educated and maybe it's 
they're patient advocates and they want to prevent decline and ensure optimal performance. So that's a neat statistic. I would 30 to 5 of the range and then anything above or below would spur the audit. And the same goes for the rest of them so you have that range. Okay, so hopefully that's helpful for you. Um, um, a little bit less. But. Okay, very good. So then we go into the, so, I'm, so that's really giving you a overview of this report. And what I suggest is that you get your report, you analyze it, and you use your PEPA report as part of your annual compliance plan. And that leads into the next slide because, as you know, the OIG has an annual report. And that annual report tells you where they have concerns. So as you're developing your annual compliance plan, thread into it PEPR analysis and audits to validate and justify service delivery and to identify if there's a risk area. For example, the facility that I mentioned that simply did not complete COTs. Now, again, for the old those of us that have been around, when you know fraud was perceived or taught that there was an intent, there was an intent to do something. It was a therapist putting in minutes down when they didn't do it. So that'd be an obvious example. But you see, it's fraudulent if you have reckless disregard. So if you do not know that you needed to do the COTs, then guess what? You're liable. And the other piece that I will tell you is that as you audit and you think that maybe there's something gone awry, you definitely should then do the audit under client attorney privilege and figure out systemically, educationally, what you need to do to correct it. And realize that you can correct your billing for 120 days. So that's 30, 60, 90, that's four months. So make sure that you have a system within your organization to audit any aberrances because you want to correct them and find it before it's systemic. And it's prevalent. It's a very complicated industry. So errors can easily occur. And you need to utilize this tool to navigate through what I call the 20-80% principle, right? 20% of your time yields 80% of your results. I'm always giving you the nuggets for the 20%. This is one of those nuggets. Look at your pepper, audit the, the blue dots above and below, establish a plan, and ensure that it doesn't occur, if there is a problem, that it doesn't occur again. So the concept of compliance is to you know, identify, to, to detect, deter, and to mitigate. So you want to detect poor practices, you want to prevent it and educate and go on and fix it. So don't be fooled. The PEPR is a report to identify fraud. That is what it is, OK? So therefore, you need to embrace it. So OK, so we're going to keep on going. So you have other entities, you know, OAS, OEI, and the OIG, and all of them. And these entities are here to help you identify and correct. So I know that um, the team has another call tomorrow on the CIA, the Corporate Integrity Agreement, and there's some updates on that, which is very important. But understand, I've worked with the OIG, and when they do identify errors, I will tell you that they then bring in a separate team to work on the corporate integrity because they don't want you to feel, oh, no, I did something wrong, and they're going to try to help you correct it because it, it, it happens. It's a complicated industry. So the OIG is here to help. They're here to look and find where there could be some miscodings, where there's some lack of education. But the key is that you do not let it go too far. And that's why this, this report is very valuable. We complete the PEPR every month for our customers. So we take the data and just thread it into our reports. So we automatically audit those areas as part of our compliance program and identify where they can improve upon. I cannot stress enough the value of that ongoing audit 
You know, some people think, well, you know, every quarter it's too late. I had I just had a call this morning, and it was it was a denial. And I said, if you had audited this, you would have been able to correct it versus getting in the situation that you're in. So the the other piece that the the perception of and and all of the CMS and OIG reviews. We know that from a Thomas Burton article in the Wall Street Journal in November of 2012, you know, they're very focused on this 25% error rate on the MDS. Now, between you and me and the 1,000 people plus on this call, when I first saw the 25% error rate on the MDS, I had to tell you, I thought that was pretty good. Because I'm in medical records, or I had been in medical records pretty much for the last 20 years. So it's extremely easy to miscode an MDS, especially for my AAA MDS coordinators on the call that are so organized and they realize how easy it is. So when I saw the 25%, I'm like, huh, I thought it was good, but it's bad. It's 1.5 billion. So let's see. So therefore, the government's looking to recoup those, that, those monies. Now, of interest, the 25% is a little bit ill-defined in the context of was it an error or did it not have supporting documentation? right? Or, and, and where was the misunderstanding there? And you also know the other piece to this whole billing practices, you know, this is a real, real rabbit hole we're going to go down right now, but that first bullet that says therapy services billed at a higher level, even though the beneficiary characteristics remain unchanged. Well, we can have a big discussion about this, because when I explained to you that patient in the beginning, that was a max assist, and it was an extensive, and then he was a min assist three times and was an extensive, you and I both know that that does not depict a change, right? So, and let's couple that with the GMO settlement and the mere fact that the false improvement standard of the fact that, hmm, so I can't treat this MS patient that's going to deteriorate? Oh, it's okay to let them deteriorate? No. The daily skills, knowledge, and judgment of a therapist may be highly, highly beneficial, but that patient may not on paper improve, nor maybe they'll even decline, but that skills, knowledge, and judgment was beneficial to the patient. I say this to you because we have to make sure that the patients are getting the services that are, are appropriate for them. So. Those are, a little, those are two rabbit holes that I'm going down with you. Number one, does the ADL coding tool really give you the ability to show improvement and decline? Number two, think about the GMO settlement. Is it fair to judge a patient's therapeutic involvement based on outcomes alone? And it's not. Okay. So this is what your pepper looks like. Historically, it was mailed to you. No longer do they mail it. You have to go online, and you have to be very important to download it. You have to be the administrator, and you have to put in your NIC, NIC number, NIH, no, your NIC number, NIC number, and a medical record that was billed during that time. So that's what sometimes I think that's why it's sometimes difficult to get. But you go online and you get it. It just came out in April. Now, it also gives you data for the last three years. So that's great, right? But you don't you want to know where you sit today. So you want to compare and contrast the, the pepper from this the formalized pepper with what your data looks like today. Okay? So it has six to five areas, no you know, no more so it's you have your it's all about your facility. There are six targeted areas and only five now. It compares you to, to other SNPs and nationally, and um, you have to sign up. And I gave you the resources to go and get your pepper. Okay. Now I'm looking at my time, so we did that already. And you have let's see what else we're going to look at here. Outliers. Okay, so this is interesting. So we're on slide 20, and CMS is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And again, the concept of this PEPR is that 
well, wait a minute, why are you higher? Why are you lower? We know that this is just as a good map to navigate on which facilities to look at. I mean, numbers are important. Big data is important. And so they're going to use this, you know, percentile ranking. And by the way, I'm not going to get into the mathematics of it because a lot of these same mathematics will be used for your um, your um, quality indicators. So at the end of the day, it's, 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 an, it's a metric that may not be perfected from a standard deviation perspective, but it's definitely the choice, the method of choice. So they're saying that if you're in the bottom 20th percentile, it could be perceived as poor quality of care. Now, the example facility that was at 72% of rehab was not giving enough therapy, they were understaffed, and the, the, the service was poor. Okay? Good information. So I have five minutes, and let's see, what else do I want to talk about? And okay, one other thing to be aware of with these target areas is that you need to look at the volume of patients, and there's two times that it might be a little bit confusing. So let me give you an example. If all of my patients are in a 9 out of 10 are in a rehab rug or a therapy rug, but your non-therapy rug high ADL is off the charts, it could simply mean that it's the volume. It's such a low volume that it's not even, you don't need to do an audit. So be mindful of the fact that with your activities of daily living, always look at the count, the count of um, claims that are being reviewed. Okay, so that's a nugget for you as well. So, so I keep going here. The percentile rankings we reviewed, and there are outliers. Let's make sure we get through all of these ADLs. We talked about ADLs interventions. If above, see, I'm always ahead of myself. So, overcoding. And you know, when you're looking at the word overcoding or, or undercoding, again, where do you go back to? You're going back to that MDS. You're going back to the perceived understanding of what the, um, the definitions are. The other area they want to look at is you want to look at your automation. So automation with all of these changes, be very mindful of the fact that the definitions may or may not match up and you need to give that feedback to the to the software providers and you need to look at if there's some automatic funneling of coding to validate. So in other words, when you're looking at the patient's ADLs, it's over a 24-hour period and the most support provided. So again, we're going back to those ADLs and now we'll go talk about change of therapy. Um, with those COTs, Every therapist needs to be aware. You need to have a system in place. You need to have a logbook, and you're looking at those those minutes on a daily basis or on a weekly basis in the group. So therefore, is something happening now? Another trigger too is that if there's a ton of COTs occurring, that could be indicative of understaffing or poor planning. In other words, COTs. Oh, we didn't give enough therapy. The, the therapist called them sick, but you didn't have a backup therapist. Or, right, or they just missed the treatment. So extremely telling information can come from too many or too little change of therapy assessments. And or we got like three minutes. And by golly, go back to your original Chapter 8 health insurance manual. Understand why and how therapy should be delivered in the post-acute setting? What is the rationale for skilled services? Are the therapists trained? Do they understand that regardless of discharge destination, that over 87 requires them to do an assessment, establish a treatment plan, and integrate with the nursing staff to provide phenomenal care? And again, we're not seeing a lot of the nine-day episodes of care. and it's something that, well, let's talk about that for a second. So 
with regards to 90-day episodes of care, it's, it's very easy for a clinician to treat a subacute patient, right? We want to talk about length of stay. We want to talk about clinically anticipated stay. But, okay, now they're going to reside in the facility. Just because they reside in the facility doesn't mean they do not require oversight by a therapist. So take a good look. And, by the way, the GIMO, the GIMO is, in essence, hey, establishment of a maintenance program. So Part B patients qualify for that as well. I've met with a few providers this week, and they're doing outstanding um, restorative programs. And, you know, in order to keep the patients engaged and keeping them moving to prevent decline and prevent falls. So an area that is definitely losing focus or has lost focus. Okay. So we did that already. Documentation. We did those. And below the 20th. Very good. We did those. Um, let's talk about corrections. We, I mentioned it briefly, but realizing that when you have errors, be mindful that errors need to be corrected but then monitored. With an effective compliance program, we had an example that the MDS minutes did not match, match the UB04, which did not match the billing log. As you all know, this is considered a false claim even though the minutes could be 800, 820, and 850. And with the false claim, the government will not only recoup the dollars, they will also have fines. And those fines are used to be, are there 5,000 and 11,000 per claim? There was just a memo yesterday that came out that they're going to be, I don't even know if they're going to be doubled, but it's going to be higher. You will be fined if you do not have an effective compliance program. So. The PEPPER is a phenomenal tool to kick off your compliance program by using this data to establish your annual compliance plan and build off of that because we know that the Affordable Care Act mandates compliance programs in all your buildings and it was even further cemented in the proposed rule that came out past the past July and we'll talk about compliance with Walters Kluwer and their program and so there's a lot that can, that can be done with this report. So let's see how much I skipped over, because you know I'm not really good with the, uh, the slide thing. Yeah. I did good then. Hi, I did good, yeah. right? So in other words, sometimes I'm ahead of the slides, but it's all about the story. So I know that I'm going to pass it off to Chris Pano, and but before that, if you need me to look at your peppers, You'll email me, and I will do a free analysis. I will get you that grid that I did, that dashboard, and I'll do a write-up for you and tell you the areas you need to focus, and hopefully that will be helpful to you. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass it over to Chris, and he's going to show you. Oh, she, sorry. He's going to show you. I'm a Chris, too. This is what happens when you have the Chris name. Mm -hmm. And show you the, the, the phenomenal Walters Kluwer program. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, I'm going to swap over screens in just a moment. So if the um, audience could just give me one moment to switch my screen. And so what I'd like to do is to um, show you the uh, Audit and Revenue Resource Center, our Walters Core resources. And hopefully, if someone could just confirm that you're seeing the Audit Revenue Resource Center screen, or not yet. We are indeed. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Mary. Um, and so I have moved into our Audit Revenue Resource Center, which is one of our solutions in our coding suite. It's our most comprehensive solution in that suite of products. And it provides not only coding and reimbursement resources along with tools, but comprehensive regulatory content um, that support your compliance activities, including your PEPPER analyses. Um, first and foremost, as healthcare professionals, we need to keep up with the ever-changing regulatory landscape. Our industry changes daily, and our comprehensive content is organized into libraries and collections. And as such, we're keeping you abreast of those regulatory changes related to those collections. Um, we provide you alerts. 
we provide a couple of those. Our first is our daily news alert, which is a state and a federal newsletter. And that's going to be based on the content of your subscription as well as your individual user preferences. So each user can define what they would are interested in being alerted on related to their subscription settings. Um, so you'll see here, as today is going on, we're accumulating our resources. You can see where the OIG work plan made your update just was released. And information like that is communicated through our daily news alert, which actually comes to our user in an email format as well. We also provide a federal newsletter, a weekly alert, which is our weekend review. And that's going to give us insight into those big federal changes so we don't miss anything major coming down the pike. And then lastly, as a user, I'm able to actually create custom alerts that are based on my individual needs. So based on a specific search that I've executed, I can actually save that search and generate alert, alerts from that search. Now given the healthcare complexities, um, when occasionally things do go, do go wrong or when we are seeing trends in our profession, uh, we are going to need to have resources to facilitate further investigation. And so whether that be an internal issue or an external audit, um, it's imperative that you have a clear understanding of coding and compliance resources surrounding the issue. With our Walters Core Solution, you do have the ability to browse content and, and navigate into specific collections, like for instance that OIG work. Uh, OIG library where I would find some of those special reports that were mentioned, the work plan, etc. But I can also search across my collections. And I can do that in an advanced fashion where I'm able to enter in multiple search terms, um, up to three. At the same time, I can define exactly how I want that search to be executed. And then I can run that search across all of my libraries and collections at the same time. So I have really that one-stop shop where I'm able to see all of my individual resources and I'm able to define what I want to search at that moment in time. And at this point is where I could actually save that search and create that custom alert as I mentioned earlier. Now when questions do rise up related to um, CPT and HCPCS coding, we do have an advanced code explorer that can help um, to surface and bring forth the regulations, um, the coding rules, and information about the specific codes in question. Uh, this particular code explorer, when I enter a code, I can also enter in by, by terms. But it's going to allow me to see um, those in my results listing, not only the description, high-level payment information from a hospital and physician perspective, but also links to additional content about the given code. I can navigate into our coding catalog or code book, which is going to give you all of your specific descriptions. It's going to provide AMA guidance um, in, the, in the headers, the additional guidance that the AMA is publishing in their code books, as, along with all of the descriptions, specific citations. And even um, on these screens, I'm going to see uh, towards the bottom some national payment information based on different payment systems. But beyond just getting the coding definitions and, and the parentheticals and that additional guidance, we also have links to related transmittals. So I can specifically see if there have been transmittals that issued that mention that specifically code. I'll have links directly to those along with LCDs. So I can understand coverage requirements for any given code. And the coverage requirements are going to be surfaced based on states that um, I have preferred or I have set as my preferred states. We also have access to our coding guidance library, which provides um, official coding guidance from the AMA and AHA, as well as a number of CMS resources as well. Um, so beyond the reimbursement rates that you see on, on the screen here, um, we also have other payment calculators. These these rates are, are surfacing provider-specific or locality-specific rates for hospital, outpatient, and physician, leveraging those two calculators. But we have other payment calculators. We have a beautiful MSDRG grouper and calculator to help us analyze inpatient reimbursement. We also have other specialty calculators to analyze reimbursement under psych, rehab, uh, long-term care, and SNF facility PPS. Now beyond um, CPT coding, we also have an ICD explorer, which is quite helpful. Um, this is going to let me explore both um, 
ICD-9 and 10 simultaneously, so side by side, and where I'm going to be able to see uh, each of those code sets explored based on a search term, or I could also code search. Uh, we have included the gems within those tools, so I am able to crosswalk using the gems uh, if I want to see how CMS specifically mapped the code to I-10. But more importantly uh, is those additional links that you see at the right of the code. Um, just like I showed you with the CPT codes, we have additional links to the actual code books themselves where we're spelling out all the individual reportable codes to the LCDs that have mentioned that specific ICD-10 code in this instance, uh, specific to states that I've chosen, as well as guidance libraries and uh, payment system code books. And so, as I mentioned, we have a number of payment calculators to support your individual needs. We also have payment system code books along with all your other coding resources that you might need. Additionally, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our ComplyTrack part product. While I don't really have time to go into a full demonstration of those, that product, um, ComplyTrack is offered in multiple modules to support a variety of needs. The Audit Detail Manager module um, can actually provide organizations with workflow tools to assist them in managing an audit when an audit actually does occur, whether that be uh, a specific MAC or another uh, uh, commercial or a governmental audit, any type of claims-based audit can be managed within that solution that allows you to manage that workflow so that you can stay on track from the point of receipt of the audit to responding, um, forget, uh, obtaining your results, as well as any appeal activity that might occur. So it really, get, really covers the full circle the full life cycle of that audit. And ComplyTrack other, offers other modules as well to compliance professionals, whether it be assessing organizational risk with a risk assessment manager uh, as, or, uh, or other um, robust modules uh, to support your compliance needs. So I'm going to turn over the program now to Ross and uh, see if we have any questions that he sure. would like to ask Mary. Or uh, Chris, I'm sorry. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, actually, Chris Panos, uh, there is one question that uh, someone had asked, can you show the guidance for coders uh, as long as you're, so you have the sure. audit resource center. Revenue do. Resource center open. Yes. Yeah, the guidance for coders a library has a number of robust resources that includes uh, the, it, in our most robust product in the Audit Revenue Resource Center includes the AHA and AMA titles the CPT assistant and your coding clinics, but it also includes a number of other CMS resources, code edits, um, audit resources, and it also includes um, the code books themselves. And we do give you a number of ways to navigate, but the current code sets, code books are also available in that collection. So you can search across that library as well. Great. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, You're welcome. I, I guess the this next question is is for uh, Chris Mestrangelo. Uh, it was just a, I think a question for clarification. Are there five or six target areas? Uh, and the questioner wrote, "I thought they're no longer reporting on therapy rugs as of this year." I think Correct. Looking, there yeah. are only five. The PowerPoint has six in there. To, and that's why it was in red on one of the slides, okay. that they removed the therapy rug utilization metric. So there are now only five. Excellent question. Okay. Great. One more question for you, Chris. Uh, a, a question asked, how are you able to review the PEPA reports for your clients on a monthly basis? Um, excellent question. Again, we when we go into our clients, we collect their data, so we know their um, rugs leveling. So we create that exact report that I showed you on the slide, and we put it in our reports. So I I create the I take the data and I calculate it myself. Okay, great, great. Thank you, and that's. Um, as of right now, that those are the only questions that we have. 
uh, for the session, but I, I should remind everyone, I think we have maybe a moment left here. If you do have any other questions, please feel free to uh, type that information in under the question section on the uh, GoToMeeting, I'm sorry, GoToWebinar toolbar that's on the right-hand side. But I think, you know, just again, not seeing any other questions uh, being added. Oh, so here's one more. How often is Pepper data released? Pepper data is released once a year. Right now, it comes out on or about in April, and and it's, this is, I think, the third or the fourth year that it's been out. But it doesn't go back just one year. I think it goes back about three years. I do actually, when I when if I do a free Pepper analysis for you, I will give you an analysis of all your historical pepper and compare each area so you can see if it's changed. Um, and I'll give it to you in a bar graph form so it's user friendly. So the answer to your question is that it comes out once per year. Great. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, that is that is all the questions that I see on uh, in the for the webinar at this point. Uh, it is, uh, it looks like a minute past 12.30 Central Time, 1.30 Eastern, uh, and uh, about the ending time for this call. Uh, so again, wanted to thank uh, you know, Chris Mastrangelo uh, for the excellent presentation, uh, the deep dive into Pepper, and thank uh, Chris Panos uh, from Walters Kluwer for her uh, demonstration of the Audit and Revenue Resource Center. Um, if you have any additional questions, please uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, through MediRig support. Uh, and again, if anyone needs a copy of the handouts of the slides from this presentation, that's also available on the right-hand navigation bar under the handout section. It's a PDF that you can single click and download to your, to your computer. Thanks again to everyone for your time. Uh, have an excellent uh, Wednesday and a great rest of the week.